Welcome yet again. It's our final reading of this, uh, this year's Poetry at Tech, uh, finishing up 10 years uh, exactly uh, now. Uh, I think we brought about 150 poets here in the last uh, 10 years uh, to, to read and to teach. Uh, as McEver visiting uh, uh, faculty, uh, professors. Uh, about a third of those uh, poets have been from Georgia, uh, partly because we want to honor uh, our, our own and because the people who endowed the, the chairs are both uh, Georgians and uh, just think it matters to, uh, to share these gifts uh, with, with as many people from Georgia as possible, as well as bringing uh, poets from all over the world. We've had poets from uh, several different countries uh, here, as well as all over America. Uh, Kwame Dawes is going to read uh, uh, first. Uh, Kwame is a, he's a, he's an actor, as well as a poet. I, I think of primarily as a poet, but uh, he's an actor, he's a musician, he's a nonfiction writer, he's a fiction writer, uh, he's a scholar. Uh, he's been uh, tremendously, uh, he, he was born in Ghana and uh, grew up mostly in uh, Jamaica, uh, taught for many, many years at the University of South Carolina, and just recently uh, began uh, teaching at the uh, University of Nebraska. That's quite a change, uh, Kwame. Uh, uh, one of the things he said was, not many black folk around here in, in, in uh, Nebraska. Uh, but let me just tell you a few of his, uh, a few of his books, the most recent books. Uh, one, one is here, Wheels. Uh, there's a, a book called Wisteria, Poems from the, the Swamp uh, Country, and uh, another book called Impossible uh, Flying. Uh, for, for many years, he was a distinguished poet in residence at the University of South Carolina. Uh, very deeply uh, influenced by uh, reggae music, and Bob Marley in, in particular, the uh, reggae aesthetic uh, he refers to it as. Uh, I just, I just love the, the sweet lyricism of his poems and, and, and the passion uh, for justice in his poems. I don't know, I forget who said, uh, which one of the Beatles maybe, all you need is love. Uh, I think uh, first, before love, we need justice. And uh, Kwame is concerned with, with that. Uh, and his poems are just tremendously spiritually and, uh, and emotionally uh, generous. Good evening. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tom, and thanks for having me. This is a, a really important series, and um, it's a tremendous honor to be just checking. You know, you got to check <laughs> these things. <laughs> you don't know what I was looking for, do you? That's right, good. Um, <laughs> it's a tremendous honor to be part of this series. Um, I'll read poems, uh, and, 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 and hopefully we'll be engaged. I'm going to read mainly from a new collection uh, called Wheels. And um, Wheels began with a series of poems that, that echoed, um, that sort of drew on uh, the book of Ezekiel. So, so this is the, the whole idea of the wheels. Um, and sometimes I give myself these challenges of taking something quite difficult and strange and, and trying to make poems around it. Uh, you will not recognize the book of Ezekiel from the poems that I'm going to read. Um, so I say that just to assure you that there's an actual, there's some, something brilliant behind these poems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's my, re my, my assurance to you. Uh, this is a sequence from, from the section called Wheels, a poem called Our Colossal Father Again. Um, in a sense, this poem was written during the reign of George W. Bush. <laughs> sub heavy world, sub as you spin. W. H. Auden. One. The portrait painter's art works like faith that turns the wafer, the decanter of wine, into something else. A dragon swaggers through the portal of our century, striding into a Gothic sky. Two, 
in another country, olive groves and gleaming mosques are pulverized to dust. Outside the white courtyards, bloody streets fade after sudden explosions. Three, he is a throwback to grand lawgivers who stretched their arms over the world. We will remember him for his Augustian self-denial, a last beer he drank, and his mealy-mouthed sermons. And four, his prophets pour oil that rises in floods across the marbled floor. Better a good name than costly oil. The day of death than the day of birth. In the faint light of dusk, he seems to be walking on water. <clears throat> um, the second poem I'll read is, uh, is the, 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 the title poem uh, for the collection, and it's simply called Wheels. Ezekiel saw a wheel turning way in the middle of the air, a wheel within a wheel a turning. The gangly televangelist suffered the insults of schoolmates, but promised no rancor in the afterlife. He still looks the geek, clumsy, heavy-headed, bloated chin, and a way of talking with an auctioneer's impatience and alarm. He longs to dream the vision of beasts with double wings, one set outstretched, the other folded over their groins. The spirit of the beast caught in the centrifuge of wheels interlocking, wheels turning and turning, the spark of roaming eyes caught in the rims. This is how God used to fill the sky, touch red embers to the lips of prophets and teach the naysayers <coughs> penitence. The televangelist is waiting his body stiff beside his snoring wife, the pale cilia on his skin, alert antennae, to catch every errant wind of faith. So these are very uplifting poems that um, uh, I hope will, will really encourage you. Uh, and on that note, I'll read a poem called Genocide Again. <clears throat> If a man were to wake in Sun City, he would smell the truth of prophecy. Those close by will die by machete blow. Those far away will die of the plague. And those who are spared will know the famine of orphan days. The youth wandering motherless through the hollow houses, tucked into the overgrown valleys and hills. The yam vines choked by the verdant bush and the earth swallowing the wet stain of a dead body. The famine will soon destroy the remnant, leaving an impossible cavity in the nation. A man wakes to the truth that sometimes God's word smells like the rotting flesh of murdered bodies scattered among broken incense bowls, cold, wet fireplaces, strewn clothes, splatters of blood on the floor, an overturned pot, rice grains hardening in the stale air, and an empty leather sandal. Thank you. These are the times we live in, <coughs> difficult times. I spent some time in Ethiopia some years ago. I was on assignment with the BBC, I like to say that. Um, but I was on assignment with the BBC. They sent me to Ethiopia to investigate the life of um, Haile Selassie. Uh, it turns out Haile Selassie spent part of his exile in the town of Bath in England. And so the BBC was interested in, in, in me tracing Selassie's movement to, to Bath from Ethiopia. Um, so I wrote a series of poems called The Measure. And this is one of the poems called 10 Imperial Rules, Notes of a Disgruntled Palace Servant. So this is the palace servant with the 10 imperial rules. Um, so that means there'll be 10. 
<laughs> in case you're counting. <laughs> One, collect bad ministers, keep them close, give grandiose gifts to, those, to these. A good minister must have much to lose. Collect bad ministers so you may shine. Chaos demands the salve of order. Two, teach absurd rituals. Encourage slavish practices, bowing and scraping, bobbing heads, elastic necks, the backward retreat, a shuffle. By contrast, acts of benevolence will seem quite holy. Three, the only useful tyranny is loyalty. Avoid the stench of reform. It splinters a simple single sun into galaxies, a constellation of distracting loyalties. Four, let the poor know the hand that feeds them by withholding the hand that feeds them. And when the flies have darkened their faces and the skeletons stay bowed in the streets, Five, teach love by the caress of soft fingers as if running through the silk of a lion's cub's tawny fur after the lingering sting of a merciless slap. Six, never speak loudly. Know the, the miserliness of whispers, the magic of silence. Never speak with the wise, only listen to the wise so the wise can imagine the depth of your wisdom. Treat words like the detritus of thought, the debris clogging streams in rainy weather. Hoard words in the brain. Name the ministry of words, the office of sanitation. Seven, always, always keep the airs clean digging out the wax of rotten words. The air is the precious funnel, the gilded grill, best left unclogged by the debris of talkers. The air can discern anarchies a province away if kept polished, clean, purged. Eight, at the palace gates give extravagantly to the poor and let them fight over copper coins, scraps of cloth, and the oil of the emperor's blessing. Offer large gifts and promises to the nobles at the filthy back doors of the palace in the gloom before night. Nine, arrive always with bombast and alarum. Remember, the throne adds dignity only by contrast to abject humility. A throne glows in a sea of burlap. And 10, treat those who demur to your gifts for the sake of the people as corrupt. Only friends will take a bribe from a king. So in, in the event that you're going to be a dictator, um, please work with those. They, they're very handy. It's a poem called African Postman for Burning Spear. I met a man called Solomon Ephraim Wolf in a town called Shesh Sheshemani in Ethiopia. He was a Rasta man who had moved to Ethiopia uh, because the emperor had left land for diasporic Africans who wanted to return. I made the mistake of asking him how it felt when Selassie died. And he rose in anger to remind me that Haile Selassie is not dead. African postman. Son, who is that? Is the African postman daddy? Burning Spear. East from Addis Ababa, and then south deep into the Rift Valley, I can hear the horns trumpeting over the flat-roofed acacia trees, see African women bend low with wood heavy on their backs, and their cows, goats, donkeys, mules, sheep, and horses snapped into obedient herds by sprinting children moving along the roadside. Life happens here. 
I'm traveling to the land, the land I have heard about, Sheshemani, the green place, 500 acres of jazz benevolence, and I know now that I long to hear the rootsman tell me how, despite the rumors of his passing, the Nati keeps on riding, keeps on standing in the fields of praise to hold on to the faith of roots people. Brother Solomon, you put the name of Ephraim on your head and carry the face of the true Rasta, the face of an Ashanti warrior, eyes deep under heavy lids, and your skin tight as leather, blacker than black. I have met you before on the streets of Kingston, there where you trod to the hiss and the slander of the heathen, you, Natty Dread, gathering the people's broken minds into your calabash. You carry it all. Tell them, return to the roots. The healing shall take place. You, a burning spear's voice in a field of teff. You tell me of the prophecy of Marcus, and I listen to you through the phlegm, through the gruff of your voice. Then suddenly, when I ask about the passing of the emperor, you rise up like a staff of correction, your voice reaching back to the mountains, your warrior self, your yardman greatness, and you speak a mystery of those who have ears but won't hear, who have eyes and won't see, and I know that this dread will one day stand in this soil and find his feet growing roots, that soon the earth will be darker for the arrival of Solomon. Let the heathen rage, let the doubter scoff, let this Ghanaian and youth whose eyes have seen the face of Jesus Christ. Let him too sit and marvel at the faith of the Natty, for this African postman has forsaken father and mother and has come to stand before his imperial majesty to call only him father so that the father might call him son and the world will carry on its weary march, and the ibises will swoop in the Ethiopian dusk, and the smoke will rise from wood fires, and the night will come with news that the rootsman, after 400 years of being told he's homeless, has come home. Yes, Ja, oh, has come home. Sons and daughters of his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, earth rightful ruler, without any apology, say, this is the time when I and I and I will come home yes ja oh come a hold the fort come a hold the fort na le go na le go na le go <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> and this is a poem for Selassie. Selassie lost his, um, his advisor and confidant while he was in Bath, a man called Heroi, who died in 1940. Um, he died in Fairfield Villa in Bath, England. This is a poem in the voice of Haile Selassie. Heroi. I walk two miles to Bath in rain. The Humberg will keep me from fevers and a trembling death this winter. I have not heard the soft tread of your feet at my back for months. Now all I hear is the shadow of your voice in the soft wind through trees. I prayed for you in Malvern yesterday. An owl hooted like the owls in Wando Gannett. It is still the rainy season in Harar and the mountainsides will be bright with the mescal daisies of the new year. There is nothing more desolate than death in a foreign land. I brought you here to see you die. We try to chant the prayers of our people. So take comfort, friend. Jesus will speak our language too. I could hear him whisper Amharic in the trees over the Lockwood Cemetery. I feel naked now. They have stolen all we had, and Halifax, as you said, wears a buana hat, and his mouth is full of the deceits of colonizers. They want our holy land, Horoi. Though these obsequious Bathonians smile, they do so with pity. An emperor needs justice, not pity. He needs arms and the flint of resistance, not the milk of pity from peasants. But these are the gifts we have been given. And it is no longer your worry, my friend. I have no friends I can trust anymore. 
no one who loves me with your simple obedience and wisdom. I look back on the climb up Kelston Road, half expecting to see you shuffling, bound behind. The road home seems a long way. We should have died with Italian sabers in our throats on the streets of Addis, not here in this mute city. Forgive me, my friend, for not granting you the hot, noble death of a patriot. All I have given is this eating disease, reducing you to a shadow huddled in the yellow bath stone, like Toussaint, Napoleon, and all ensnared warriors, weaponless and impotent as infants. Forgive me, my brother, my father, my friend. <clears throat> Three more poems. This is what you have to do, you know, because people are thinking, when is he going to stop? <laughs> so, so I'm telling you, there are three more poems. So you can, but they're long, so. <laughs> I want to read a poem for Haiti. I, I, I was in Haiti about four or five times after the earthquake, uh, reporting on the people who were living with HIV AIDS in Haiti and how they were surviving after the earthquake. And one of the things that struck me, and I wrote a sequence of poems which, which are very moving to me, very important to me, but one of the things that struck me was that it was the women who carried so much um, after the earthquake, and especially those who, who were living with HIV AIDS. They were the ones who would be tested first, and they were the ones who would have to carry the news home to their partners and their spouses. They were the ones who would then have to look after them because they seemed to survive, and they would have to care for people who they knew may have betrayed them. They would have to bury their children, and many would have to know that they had passed on the disease to their children. But they were strong. And I won't say they were resilient, because it's almost a cliche to say people are resilient when they're poor and when they're struggling. But they had tremendous dignity, and they welcomed me in a beautiful way. So I wrote this poem called Mother of Mothers for, for the Women of Haiti. When a brave woman's out walking, she's Mistress Life's spitting image, Michel Ange Hippolyte. The mothers of mothers march through the congregation while the children of men clap their hands, beat tambourines, scratch the grater, and sing the flat harmony that shivers the air. Beneath a cascade of flame yellow and red flamboyance, they stalk the outskirts of the feet-worn worship ground where the weeds and stones have accumulated, where the excavation of rubble takes us as far as weary arms and the creaky wheelbarrow can go. They draw a pattern of circles with their heavy planted feet, their arms raised high, their voices continuing with greater ceremony and occasion. The conversation that began with Jesus at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, the mother of mothers who knew, who know too well the hottest sorrow, how much a casket weighs, how it feels on the open palm the broken bodies of children, the boy who covers a jaw full of maggots, and the lanky son whose spine gave under the weight of concrete before he was pulled out, laid up under the soft blue light of a wayside clinic waiting to go, and quietly, with the flies returning to his skin, still, though he must wait there until dusk, before they notice, before a procession of mothers leads the body out into the night and mother of a son, she hears her child wake, look around and say, how nice the air is out here, before he dies this time for good. Mothers of mothers, in your bandanas and with your holy testaments, cheekbones gleaming against taut skins, eyes glazed, you must draw the line of defense around beleaguered souls and speak a torrent of curses on the beast lurking in the shadows. <coughs> Thank you. So I'm going to end with two poems, um, one for my wife and then one for my wife and my kids, which, which would seem fitting. Um, because the kids are 
just awful. And if I read, if I don't read, if I don't read a poem about them, they get very upset. So they're nice kids, but you know. This is a poem for my wife. It's called Sketch. It's also a poem for South Carolina. I miss South Carolina. I miss the South. I miss the bodies. I miss the heat. I miss the woman at Starbucks when I just went in the airport and I said, I need this coffee thing. And she says, that would be 50 bucks. And so <laughs> that doesn't happen in Nebraska. They don't think that's funny in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> in Nebraska, if you're spending too much money, they get upset with you, even though you're paying them. <laughs> so, <laughs> sketch. With graphite, I soften your bones, make exotic the absence of your lash, your fingers, neat, elegant cradle of plum, the light of its juice flaming vermilion through the taut skin. I etch out your gaze, tender, tender, about your forehead where the howl of darting pain creases all, softly, as if with the soft lead I can calm it all and make it all go away. You are going. With the press of my palm's heel, I caress the bald glow of your head, then clean a gray line where your brows were, now there is nothing, these markings of what you have suffered. These days, bodies crumble about me. The dead, desperate for healing, grow weary, <coughs> stoic, then quietly go. My blackened fingers make things round. You plump as a fruit just plucked. Tomorrow I lift you, bird of bones, your limbs collapse. There is sunlight crawling across the lawn despite the drought. It's resiliently green, except the narrow path of old sod we laid, traumatized by neglect, into a crude buzz cut. And this, too, is a symbol of our loss. It is August in Colombia. Nothing can fight this heat. Just stay still. Maybe a small wind will blow. Maybe a small wind. <clears throat> And finally, a poem for Kingston and, like I said, my family. This was several years ago. It's called Upon Our 14th Anniversary, and it's for Lona, my wife and the kids, and for Kingston. We drive through the irregular curves and dips of Kingston suburbs, deep craters, cluttered gullies, cutting through roads. Adjua's tiny car is a shelter of laughter and the making of nostalgia. We know. People die on these streets all the time. But tonight, we are able to forget. We spend 30 minutes making nonsense of the rituals of violence. And for a day, we recall the parts of our love, the brick porch where I sang songs into the night, the hall spine I walked up to see you in the powder blue frock, your smile, that first hit of a chronic addiction I still tremble for all these years later. Sometimes, home is a poem of lament. But tonight, we see Kingston as friend freshly painted, world of chaos, a kind of giddy playground. So that after the steamed snapper and gummy bami, the coconut water and guava pineapple juice at the fish place on the decent end of Constant Spring Road, Adjua's car is filled with our children, so loud with playground laughter and the sweetness of children teetering on the edge of rudeness, singing, Julio Iglesias and Simon and Garfunkel. We marvel at Kelly's deep baritone, him just barely 11, holding on to each note's curve as he anchors Paul Simon's thin voice until we arrive safely feeling groovy at West Road. We sit in the dark until the last guitar strum, and our voices have settled into the hum of joy. And I understand again why I love you, why I love us. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Wow, that was, that was super. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was dynamite. I, uh, 
I always like to read uh, in, uh, in Atlanta, and uh, especially at Georgia Tech, because I get a chance to say uh, once again publicly that nobody has done more for poetry in Georgia than Tom Lux. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Look at this crowd. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for the books that uh, these guys bought. And uh, don't thank me, thank Copper Canyon Press. Because uh, Copper Canyon wanted to get the books around and they, they sold these books at uh, virtually nothing. Uh, really cheaply. So pick up a book, if you will, please, and, uh, and spread the word about it, if you will. Uh, it's baseball season. Where's Tom? There you are. Uh, my mom's watching the Braves right now as we speak, and I don't know what the score is. We several know. Georgia Tech ball players here tonight. All right, where's, where are the baseball guys? All right, guys, that's good, that's good. I got a baseball poem for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I have several baseball poems, but I'm gonna read one. Uh, I've always uh, been drawn, to, I see a lot of students here, and I'm not gonna preach to the students. Uh, and I appreciate them uh, coming, coming and supporting me. But I've always been drawn uh, to the poem as sort of a method of uh, personal investigation uh, and uh, sort of a search for ultimate answers. And uh, this is one reason, this is a Tolstoy poem. I'm a huge Tolstoy fan, uh, as uh, they well know, especially War and Peace. And if you haven't read War and Peace, you haven't read great literature yet. You got a real treat ahead of you. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, after Tolstoy wrote Anna Karenina, he pretty much gave up uh, on fiction in, in favor of spiritual concerns. Uh, his, his theology was not exactly orthodox and they booted him out of the Russian church, you know that. Uh, he died excommunicated. Uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, what's important is the fact that he saw uh, literature uh, as a search and, uh, and saw the search itself as sort of meaningful for our lives. Now what the hell does that have to do with anything here? And baseball. Well, uh, when I was a kid, I played a lot of baseball, you guys. And I was not a bad second baseman uh, until I hit high school. I was a pretty good second baseman. But then you get to a certain point, you know, where you can't get around on the pitching. And that was my problem in high school.